Welcome to America's Heroes Group. Welcome back to America's Heroes Group with our roundtaper and our partner, Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Ruth Green with of Battle Proven Leadership. Today is Saturday, March 25th, 2023. March is Women's History Month. Our host is Cliff Kelly. I'm Sean Cleveland, the co-host. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith, and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And we have our partner with us, the one and only Jennifer Ruth Green. She is a lieutenant colonel of the Indiana Air Force National Guard and a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, combat veteran of Iraqi freedom, and a founder and CEO of Battle Proven Leadership. And we're going to continue this conversation about the role of a leader and also talking about some of the important things that leadership has to offer and what we need to see in our leaders. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. It's awesome to be able to connect with you again. My pleasure. So tell us, where does leadership begin? You had a you had a quote that you kind of instilled on us last time you mentioned this, and you said basically that nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So tell us about that and kind of take us down that path. Absolutely. So leadership is not a job; it's a responsibility. And so sometimes when people take on the role of a leader, it's because of you know prestige or power or position. But really, we have to consider purpose when we're talking about leadership. And if our purpose is to continue to grow ourselves, to gain ourselves, to get more money, power, prestige, or position, then we're not going to be effective as leaders because nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So you can walk in and say, hey, this this is what we're going to do. We're going to work everybody to the bone. We're going to work as hard as we can and try to do as much as we can. And we're going to meet these metrics. But if that's all to make you look good, and not to take care of your people, or you're not concerned about who they are, what they believe, why they believe it, you know, their families, that kind of thing, then it's going to be a very difficult situation for you to try to get by it. And uh, teams are built on trust. And if people can trust you, they'll crawl over broken glass for you. You've seen it. I've seen it. When you have a team of people that uh, trust one another, it's far greater, you know, the impact is far greater than a group of people who are motivated towards a common goal. Well, I would say that, especially by my time in the military and also even professionally in my careers, that it's easier to follow somebody and you, and you feel, especially with the military background, I would say, for me personally, you want to follow someone who actually cares about the mission at, at hand and who, and you feel that has, who cares about you and how you're doing rather than just barking orders. So someone that comes in and 100%. says, okay, this, this is the task at hand, this is what we need to do to get it done, but... I do care about how how this affects you. I do care about what the outcome is and what the toll is on your on you physically or mentally or, or professionally, however that might be. So tell us what are the what's the role of a leader? You have to give us three different tenets about that. Yes, and you have a really good memory. <laughs> I uh, a, a, a leader's roles I think fall into three specific categories. First of all, you have to understand the scope of leadership. You have to understand how big it is, what your responsibility is within that role. And then when you break it down a little bit later, you have to think about leadership and you, and then you have to think about leadership and other people. So the leadership and you uh, is kind of your role, your responsibility, how you prepare yourself, how you develop your uh, philosophies, and all of those individual pieces that someone must consider. And I look forward to exploring each of those elements a little bit later But understanding the scope of leadership is first and foremost. And uh, that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about today. Hmm. So take us through that. Tell us about that, those that scope. Yes. So I firmly believe, you know, if we look at those three specific areas, when we talk about a leader's, uh, you know, big picture view, you have to understand fundamentally as a leader that you have to fight for your people. And that in and of itself dovetails into what we just talked about, that leadership is not a It is not a job, it's a responsibility. And so it's a responsibility for you to take care of someone else. And so, you know, when I was was a freshman at the Air Force Academy, 9-11 occurred. And I remember exactly where I was. There was uh, the commander of Pacific Air Forces, a three-star general was there. And there was a major at the time who's now a one-star general. And uh, that major was the, the general's exec. And so the entirety of uh, the international relations with a focus on Asia, you know, the Japanese majors or the international studies majors for Asia, Japanese um, language students, Chinese language students, we were all in a room and kind of getting an, an overview, unclassified brief on what was happening in the Pacific. So we sat there and the general was talking. And all of a sudden the major comes in, Major Bell, 
and he whispers in the general's ear and he whispers something and then the general just leaves. And so as good cadets, we kind of sat there just sitting, waiting, had no idea what uh, to do or if we should move, if we were supposed to move because the general, you know, was briefing us. What if he comes back? No one's going to leave. And then eventually it became time for us to transition to the next hour class. And so we just kind of looked at one another and nobody was coming in to tell us what to do. And uh, so we got up and went to the next class, un, you know, unknowingly, uh, whether or not we were going to get in trouble because, you know, the general was expecting a room full of people. But we got up, went to the next class, and it was English. And I remember walking into English and our, uh, my instructor was a captain and there was a TV on the wall. And she, uh, we saw, you know, the images and the replay of the second plane hitting the second tower. Mm. And I don't know that I understood it at that point, but clearly that day was the start where we became a nation unofficially uh, at war. And we had been attacked and we didn't know it at the time, but, but we knew something was happening. And so turns out, you know, years later, we understood that he had whispered to the general that there's an attack and whether they brought him to safety, whether they put him in a secure location, whether he was going to get briefed on what Pacific forces, you know, his generals or his other subordinate leaders needed to say, um, that was the circumstance. And so when I talk, think about that situation, we had people in our class uh, as freshmen who um, had the opportunity to leave, to say, hey, 2002, President George Bush, Congress, they had declared our war on terror, and we were going to fight a war on two fronts. And so at, when you're at a service academy, you have until your junior year uh, when you're required to uh, commit to the, to the military. So you're going to give the military five years, whether it's uh, in, in enlisted time, whether you're in jail, whether you commission, uh, whether you pay that money back financially uh, in a compensation package and a number they provide. You are going to give them the equivalent of five years of your life. And so in light of that, um, in light of that, it was important for us to consider whether we wanted to go into our junior year and commit to being in the military. So I was pleased and excited that there was nobody in our class that said, hey, we're going to be a nation at war and we need to step down or we're not going to be in this fight. We are not going to be involved. Everybody stayed. And so it was very impactful uh, because to me, it showed me that we were here for the right reasons. We knew that our responsibility was to support and defend the Constitution. We knew that it was our responsibility to take care of people. And that's what we were going to do, take care of the American people. And so in 2009, that was when I was a young captain and was, I volunteered for a tour to Iraq. And uh, I love it, uh, this quote that's attributed to George Orwell. He says, people sleep peaceably in their beds at night because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. And for, you know, it's 2009 for seven years I had slept peaceably in my bed at night. We hadn't had, you know, the infrastructure problems. We hadn't had the opportunity. I had the opportunity to go to the hospital. I had the opportunity to drive a store. I had the opportunity to feel safe and secure. And that was because there were people who had done, or who had been ready to do violence on my behalf. And so I had classmates. Uh, previous academy grads that I had known, uh, those that I'd served alongside with at the academy who had gone and kept, you know, war at bay. And so there's significant people in my life who have been impacted, uh, who are never coming home and their families had been impacted. And I felt very strongly that it was my responsibility to go to combat for people that I knew. And so there was a man named Matt Kuglix. He was a special agent. And uh, my Air Force specialty code, MOS, rate was to be uh, a counterintelligence agent. And so I was a special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And so was Matt Kuglix. And in 2007, Matt Kuglix went to uh, the Middle East and he was on his second deployment. He had actually finished one deployment successfully. He came back and one of his colleagues had said to their commander, hey, sir, I'm not going to be able to go. Uh, I know it's my responsibility, but if I do go, it's going to cause family problems. I've been gone too much, and I need to stay home with my family. And so Matt, he volunteered to go in someone's stead. He said, I'm not married. It's fine. I'll go back. So Matt went back, 
And when he went to combat again on his second tour, unfortunately, he lost his life. Mm. And I remember going to his funeral, and I remember seeing how clearly um, loved he was by his family and his colleagues. And I remember his, the, the vision of sacrifice. And I remember that he wanted to be in a place where he could serve people, his colleagues, people that he knew, but then also in combat. And so that stuck with me. And then the summer that I was going, <clears throat> I had two classmates. Uh, one of them uh, was a classmate of mine named Mark McDowell. He was a captain. He was a pilot. And uh, he died flying over Afghanistan in combat. And he wasn't coming home. But he had gone to allow me to sleep peaceably in my bed at night. And then First Lieutenant Rosalind Schulte, she was a class behind me. Roz was amazing, incredibly smart and talented. She was an intelligence officer, and she was uh, impacted by an improvised explosive device. And Roz lost her life. And so those three people, Roz and Matt and Mark, I was fighting for them. I was fighting for people that I knew. I was fighting because their families deserve to have the safety that my family had as a result of them going over there and keeping war at bay. But my primary responsibility as a counterintelligence agent was to vet and recruit spies. That was our training. And I had some additional primary responsibilities in combat, but that was my primary training. And so I remember one day meeting a source. He was an Iraqi man, and he shared with me um, you know, the information that I was looking for and the entire time that we had worked and engaged with him over a couple of days, we had picked him up at different times. We had sent people to pick him up at different places, sometimes in the dead of night. And we wanted to be at a place where nobody could associate him working with us because very active in that region in Baghdad was Al-Qaeda Iraq. And they had a sect called Jaish al-Makdi, JAM. And they were incredibly active, and in fact, AQI, or Al-Qaeda Iraq, had kidnapped him several years prior. And um, in starting this entire venture, he had given us the information that he needed. I'm fast-forwarding and rewinding a little bit, but I'll make it clear. So I'm meeting with him in the summer of 2009, and we're sitting across from one another. It gives me the information I need. And I remember pointedly asking him, you know, why do you do this? Why do you risk your life? for American objectives. And he said, because I believe in a better Iraq and I believe that Americans can help us. And so he started telling me his story. And he started by telling me that several years earlier, how his daughter had been kidnapped, excuse me, how he had been kidnapped by Iraqi operatives and how they had tortured him and beat him and said, we know you're working for Americans. We know that you're going against Iraqis. We absolutely know this. And he said, no, I'm just an English teacher. I have nothing to do with any of this. I, I'm not experienced with anything that you're talking about. I'm just here trying to serve my country. And so they, they beat him. He was bruised and he was battered. And after three days, they finally returned him to his family because they finally believed his story. But a couple of years later, after they continued to watch him and give him many threats, they ended up kidnapping his daughter as she was walking home from a study session one day. And they called him and, and said, here's a $200,000 ransom. And if you don't pay it, you'll never see your daughter again. And so she was beaten and bruised and, and um, just essentially put in a position where she would never be the same again for seven days. And uh, I'll spare the details, but essentially after, uh, during that time, uh, he had called, you know, his American handlers mm -hmm. and basically said they have my daughter and I need to get her back and so we were able to concoct a plan and be able to rescue her and after seven days they were reunited and in thinking through this the level of sacrifice the willingness that he had to put himself and his life and the lives of his family on the line it was not for American objectives it was because he believed in something bigger than himself and it really taught me a lesson because I was there and I had volunteered my life and my time to fight for people that I knew, Roz and Matt and Mark. But he was fighting for people that he would never know. He was fighting for the country men of, uh, of his home country. 
He fought because he would never meet all the Iraqis, but he knew that they deserved a better future, and this was the way he believed it could be done. And so the scope of his leadership or the scope of his mindset was bigger than himself. And it was not only people that he knew, his family, his friends, his churchmates, people at the grocery store. It was for the entire country. And so as we fast forward in my life, I come back from Iraq and understood his scope in an entirely different way. But I just I had been safe and I knew that there were at least five times that my life was spared. And I wondered, you know, what did I do and did it matter? Well, I was at church one morning, and um, I wasn't constantly thinking about combat or thinking about, you know, the things that that I had done or, or, you know, those, it wasn't a constant in my mind. However, uh, there was a missionary that day from Iraq, and our church had been supporting him. And uh, the pastor invited the missionary to come up and, and share a few words about his experiences. And so he he was sharing, uh, he, he got up to share, and the first thing he did was just begin to weep uncontrollably. And he was at the pulpit just crying. And he began to tell us, first and foremost, thank you. He said, thank you, America, for coming to my country. Thank you so much for allowing me the freedom from the oppressive regime. He said, I was under Saddam Hussein's rule. And during that time, we couldn't worship how we wanted to. And now I have the opportunity to have freedom of worship. Now I have the opportunity to share insight and and thoughts and religious values and think differently. And now I can have, you know, my faith uh, produced on the radio station. And I can talk about what I believe and why I believe it. And he said, thank you for sending people. And I remember thinking that there was just this great lift, this burden that was lifted from my shoulders. I didn't really understand what it was, but I knew that I'd never known what my full purpose was. And so here this man now had an opportunity that he would have never had had I not gone in the first place. But at the end of the day, it helped broaden my scope a little bit more. I had gone to Iraq to fight for people that I knew, Roz and Matt and Mark. But then I realized through my Iraqi source, that I had to fight for people that I didn't know. But then I realized I was also fighting for people who would never know my name. And so I would never have met this man. I would never have an engagement or an opportunity to connect with him. But now here he is telling me how my actions in a small way had impacted his ability to be free. And so when I think about the scope of leadership, these life lessons for me have been incredible. When I think about the fact that it's my responsibility to fight for people that I know, I think about the immediate people that are in my sphere, my family, my friends, like we talked about, the, or just the people that I love. And so when I think about leadership and I think about people who are you know, running the C-suite or who are managers, you fight for the people that you see every day. Maybe it's the, the secretary who sits outside your office. Maybe it's the person who sits in the roundtable meeting with you. Maybe it's the person that you connect with. But also you have to fight for the people you don't know. If you work for a large company, there are people who don't have their names on the parking spots. There are people who will never have the opportunity to sit at the round table and you have to fight for them too. And maybe that's creating a policy like maternity leave, or maybe that's, you know, providing a lactation room, or maybe that's making something more ADA compliant. And you have to fight for people that you don't know. And you have to stand up and say, this is how I lead because the scope of my leadership is more than just the people that I talk to and see. But then lastly, thinking about fighting for people who will never know your name, you have to broaden your scope and think about 50 years from now, 75 years from now. No one's going to think of Jennifer Ruth Green. Very rarely do we have heroes in history. We think about George Washington or we think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or Mahatma Gandhi, and we think about the things that they did. You know, I, I don't know that Rosa Parks was sitting down thinking very clearly about how you know, 60, 70 years from now, African-Americans would have the freedom to have integration and ride, you know, buses and fly planes and and be a part of an integrated society. But she was willing to do what it took that day. And there's an impact today as a result of her leadership that day. And so what I think is really important for us as leaders is understanding the scope. We can't just look straight in front of us. 
We have to think about the people we don't see, but we also have to think about the people who will never see us. And when we think about leadership, if we can understand the scope of who we're, for who we're fighting, it will make us better because our decisions don't just impact us and our decisions don't just impact today. And so if we can get that foundationally and fundamentally as leaders, we will start the foundation off very clearly, and then we can continue to work on the tactical, practical methods, the hands-on ways for us to be impactful. And so those stories have shaped my life, and I believe if we as leaders can grasp that with initial, uh, in, in our initial assessment, we're going to do much better. It's interesting you brought up the Iraq War because um, we're coming up on, on a lot of um, well, a lot of people have been talking about it. That's been on the minds of many, many people because we just were talking about the execution of, of Saddam Hussein and how that went horribly wrong during the during the the idea of trying to instill democracy or or pass on democracy from the United States over into the, uh, Iraq or Iraq, I should say. How do you how do you respond to people that say that when we look at leadership and we look at the leadership we had prior to after 9-11, but prior to the Iraqi invasion, that we were going into a war for the purpose of finding weapons of mass destruction, never having found ma- weapons of mass, mass destruction. And then 20 years later, we leave, we leave um, Afghanistan essentially in the same condition, if not worse than where we found it and leave Iraq in a situation where it still has or tails whether or not we made any real progress. We have stories, yes, and we have opportunity, but Iraq is not the country it was 20 years ago. You're absolutely right. You know, when I think about the my analysis, personal analysis of the situation, again, uh, and I'll give a quick caveat, not endorsed or sponsored by the DOD in any way, just Jennifer Ukraine as a private citizen, we spent a lot of time at the beginning of this this war thinking about the war on terror, thinking, what if we lose? And to that end, we got the best uniforms. We got the best tanks, the best airplanes. We trained everybody. We changed our uniforms to desert camo because the green BDUs weren't going to be reflective and allow us to to be incognito, if you will, in the desert. We changed everything about what we needed to do. We changed our standard operating procedures to fight a different type of war. Um, You know, and so we spent a lot of time answering the question, what if we lose? So we went in and rained fire, and after two years, then we had uh, neutralized the threat effectively, as in our enemies were not capable of bringing great grave damage to our assets. We but, had established dominance. But, what, but, to, However, this, but to this point, that what, what risk did Iraq, Afghanistan, um, they, were the ground, they were the ground zero for an operation that started in Saudi Arabia that came to Iraq, I mean, I'm sorry, came to Afghanistan, trained a bunch of people to go launch plane, airplanes into buildings. What risk, what threat was Iraq to the United States other than the idea that we thought as, as a nation, we were told as a nation, that they had weapons of mass destruction that would turn out to be false? What other threat did they pose to America? That's a good question. I, I don't have any specific answers to that. But what I do know is that the commander-in-chief does not make decisions in a vacuum. And so if there are, um, there's a cabinet, there are chiefs of staff. There are secretaries uh, that involve their entire decision making and assessment in, you know, speaking to the president and commander in chief. And so in thinking through that, I don't think it's fair to Monday morning quarterback uh, an executive decision only because all of us military leaders have to go on the action or the information we have at the time. And so if President Bush sincerely believe that and was willing to put the lives of Americans on the line, um, I have to trust that it was with the intent and understanding that that's what he believed. And so the president unilaterally can't constitutionally declare war. Congress constitutionally declares war. And so if all of these people were duped or all of these people were in on a plan in order to get Americans to lose their lives for the sake of what, uh, I don't know. But what I do know is that things don't happen in a vacuum and constitutionally it's a requirement for them to be able to figure out what they need to do. And so I have to trust that that's what happened. So I can't Monday morning quarterback that. And also I wasn't in the room to to understand what evidence they were looking at. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about the the push now in in the government to want uh, to kind of rewind or wind down, wind back the 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 powers of the executive branch? so the president before, under which George Bush uh, uh, pushed forward, 
the, the ability to use a lot more powers to wage war against the war on terror to get us into Iraq and, Af- and, and Afghanistan. How they're now trying to point, bring that back. And then, so I don't, didn't, wasn't aware this, we're going to go into this kind of part of the conversation, but what do you feel, how do you feel about that effort being done by the current administration now? Sure. We got, I about, think we got about 30 seconds. I'm sorry. We got about 30 seconds. Now. 30 seconds. So in, in my opinion, uh, there's this clause that allows the president to have exigent circumstances, essentially. Can't remember the title of it. But basically, if you need to deploy forces quickly and we don't have the time to wait for all of this to catch up with you, to declare war, to do this, to do that, then you have the opportunity to use emergency action. And uh, holding that back, I think, is wise because there is a great uh, requirement. There's a great risk of life um, in what the tools are that you're being willing to use. So I think it's important to have uh, many eyes on particular situations, especially involving American lives. Thanks a lot for that. I really appreciate your time, and you give us a lot of stuff to think about. And I really would love—I would love to have longer conversations with you because I think you have a lot of important things to say. And on top of that, I think as I think having that conversation is necessary. Um, I really appreciate you being on our show. This is American Heroes you. Group. You've been great always on our show. Um, so Jennifer Ruth Green, Lieutenant Colonel for Indiana Air Force, Indiana Air Force National Guard, appreciate you. That's- God bless you. Thank you. That's why we partner with excellence. Excellence be God. Excellence. <laughs> iron sharpens iron. Yes, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank Ms. Glenda, you. I appreciate the time. No, I, I know it's like a fire hose. We're talking about a lot of things. Well, we, uh, we, but we, we, we'll continue. I appreciate and, your kindness. And more Saturdays coming. Absolutely. <laughs> Just getting started. Just more getting Saturdays started. coming, so. Okay, so thank you guys. We're running short on time, but thank you guys always for listening to America's Heroes Group regarding any information or resources uh, in regards to what you may need concerning um, businesses, housing, and whatever. Please feel free to call America's Heroes Group, 312-803-2618. We're located at 155 North Wicker Drive, Suite 4250. We have four great shows today. The U- U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, oh, Michelle was fabulous. We had also the National Association of Drug Court Professional, Melissa, wow, what a personality. Richard Brashear, yes, Black Veterans Project, we just getting started. We on our way to D.C. Uh-huh, yes, we are. Then, lastly, Jennifer knocked it out the park. We appreciate you guys so much. Our digital media producer is well, and he's back. Our family is back. Yeah, Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Production, the best digital media producer we have ever had. To our technical producer, Lady Shy, who keeps us balanced every week at WBON. Blessings and love, you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. Sean, you are the co-host. Boom. (laughs) 